Natural disasters are scary. You could be walking down the street, minding your own business, and all of a sudden, an earthquake strikes, and all the buildings collapse towards you. Or you could wake up at your home to walls of flames in all directions. Natural disasters are the ultimate threat to humans, from volcanoes to hurricanes. We're just tiny in comparison. But in this second video of the series, backed by popular request, we're taking a look at the hurricane that caused $50 billion worth of damage to the terrifying Australian black summer. So strap yourselves in, go grab yourself a nice cold drink. Let's get right into it. Because Australia is generally hot and dry all year round, bushfires and wildfires are very common and can happen at any time of the year. They can be started from a simple discarded cigarette butt to a lightning strike on dry land. However, once they get going, they're very difficult to control. The problem is that 40% of Australia is undisturbed dry wilderness. So when fires start, they spread, well, like wildfire and they can burn for days and weeks on end. So Australian people are used to things just randomly setting on fire. However, in June of 2019, a blaze would start in central Queensland, leading to an early start of the bushfire season. This small blaze would grow and grow, and this would turn into the largest and most expensive bushfire seasons since 1975. In the lead up to this, in 2019, Australia had had its hottest and driest year on record. That year, they were hit with back-to-back -back heat waves, completely drying out the shrubbery and grasslands. So, because of the unusually dry land, the entire outback was just like a tinderbox, the perfect recipe for disaster. Of course, the flames grew at an exponential rate. Firefighters tried desperately to control them, but the ground was so dry, with every gust of wind, the flames leapt from one dry surface to another, from grass to trees, and ultimately onto people's homes. Before long, more than 1,000 fires blazed across the state of New South Wales, and soon Victoria too fell victim. Soon, entire forests burned uncontrollably, taking lives and isolating towns in thick plumes of black smoke and burning cinders. In the face of catastrophe, many states across Australia declared a state of disaster. However, despite their best efforts to control the fires, they proved completely useless. Day turned to night as a blanket of ash settled on towns and cities, turning them quickly into dark, hellish landscapes. The ravenous flames ripped through entire forests and habitats, destroying anything they came into contact with. By November the 12th, 2019, the Greater Sydney region witnessed a declaration of catastrophic fire danger for the first time in a decade. The terrifying scale of Australia's bushfire disaster is beginning to emerge. A mass exodus from southern New South Wales is underway with long lines of cars clogging highways leading right back to Sydney and Canberra. Fire officials have told holidaymakers to urgently leave a long stretch of coastline before more ferocious fires are expected to sweep in over the weekend. Around this time, a total fire ban enveloped several regions of New South Wales. Other areas faced the same ominous fate, causing panic and urgency to protect lives and property. The fires, due to their uncontrollable dimension, unusual size and duration, were dubbed a megafire. As it raged on, an ecological tragedy unfolded. Millions of hectares were scorched, and the toll on wildlife was truly immense. The University of Sydney estimated the loss of 100 million animals and habitats, potentially leading to the extinction of entire species. Not to mention the millions of livestock that were killed from the smoke inhalation. 
It's been labelled the worst fire season ever recorded, an apocalypse, a nightmare, and like looking into the gates of hell. Firefighters continued to battle the blaze, but it continued to just spiral out of control, reaching its peak in December of 2019 and January 2020. However, late in March, the flames were finally subdued. Sadly, by then, the impact of the 2020 bushfire season was truly staggering. Thousands of homes, facilities and outbuildings were reduced to ashes. A massive 24 million hectares of land all across Australia, an area roughly equivalent to half of California, was completely consumed, leaving black forests in its wake. Hence why it was dubbed the Black Summer. In total, 34 people lost their lives just being caught in the flames, and almost 450 more people lost their lives from the effects of smoke inhalation. From the 1st of July 2019 to the end of the bushfire season on March the 31st, 2020, there were more than 11,000 bush and grass fires all across New South Wales. Because of this, New South Wales bore the brunt of the damage, with over 2,400 homes destroyed. This is all without mentioning the hazardous effects of millions of people inhaling smoke from these fires. According to Bloomberg, at the height of the black summer, walking around in Sydney would be the equivalent of smoking 37 cigarettes a day. Three years on from this disaster, this effect has had a direct impact on pregnant women who were forced to inhale these fumes. They say a four-year-old boy now needs medication twice a day to help him breathe. There's babies being born underweight, early and unwell, and experts say this is directly because of the smoke in the previous years. Australia's black summer was truly unprecedented. It consumed more land than any other in the past. Conservationists say it was one of the worst wildlife disasters in modern history, a summer that Australia will never forget. This crazy entry begins in Petropolis, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, on the 15th of February, 2022. Two days before, on the 13th of February, the National Disaster Alert issued a stark warning for the residents of Rio de Janeiro that a brutal storm was coming and that people should prepare. They warned of heavy flooding and the possibility of devastating landslides something that seems to be occurring more and more frequently in the area. According to specialists, this warning should have prompted the authorities to mobilize and evacuate the residents living on the hillsides. But for some reason, no evacuation was initiated and barely any warning was given. No city would pay the price more heavily for this than Petropolis. Petropolis is a city home to 305,000 people nestled on the side of a mountain located approximately 42 miles away from the capital. While Petropolis is a popular tourist destination in Brazil, attracting people from far and wide with its fancy beaches and beautiful cliff sides, it's not a particularly wealthy city. Like many low-income neighborhoods in Brazil, most inhabitants live on steep, rugged cliffs surrounded by mountains in all directions. However, that day, despite a storm warning being issued via text message, and storm sirens ringing, nobody seemed to take heed. Around 4.20 p.m. on the 15th, the rain started and it did not stop. Within three hours, 258 millimeters of rain was measured by rain gauges in the city. This was more than 30 days of rain in just three hours. This was the worst case of heavy rainfall in the city since 1952. But in 1952, it rained 168 millimeters in 24 hours. In this storm, they had almost 100 millimeters more in eight times less time. 
The abundant rainfall quickly caused havoc all across the city, completely ravaging it. Whole sectors of Petropolis became flooded and videos posted on social media showed muddy waters washing down streets, taking cars, buildings and trees like it was nothing. As the water flowed, something far more deadly was on its way. The heavy rainfall then caused huge landslides. The first landslide ripped through Petropolis like an avalanche, toppling houses like cards. As people prayed, entombed in mud, rescue teams made their way there. But they arrived far too late. They actually arrived in the morning, hours after the calamity, leaving the locals to help throughout the night. Some people were found alive in the mud that evening, but by the time the firefighters got to them in the morning, they had died. About eight people in my family were in the house. I've lost my nephew and his five-year-old daughter, and we still haven't found them. We didn't expect this tragedy. It's the end of our city. Regardless, everyone got on their hands and knees and dug tirelessly to try and find those who may be alive. But as they did, the mudslides just kept coming, further burying people and hampering rescue efforts. Family and firefighters continued searching through the mud, screaming for their loved ones to deafening silence. Rescue teams worked 24 hours around the clock, rotating between teams to comb through the mud, utilizing sniffer dogs, chainsaws and hand tools to work through the debris little by little. From the 15th to the 21st, approximately 250 landslides occurred, causing mass destruction all across Petropolis the governor state of Rio compared the situation to that of a war zone. By the 28th of February, the death toll had reached 231, including 27 children and teenagers. This doesn't include the five people that are still missing to this very day. The damage of the floods and mudslides exceeded 1 billion Brazilian reals, equal to 162 million Great British pounds or 202 million US dollars. But the worst part about all of this is the fact that experts state that these deaths could have been easily avoided and were indirectly caused by improper planning, rapid urbanization, and a lack of financing for subsidized housing. This terrifying entry begins on the outskirts of Turkey and Syria on the 6th of February 2023. As a strong winter storm approached Turkey, millions of people slept peacefully in their beds, completely unaware of what terrible days lay ahead of them. Something monstrous was stirring right beneath them. Because Turkey sits right above where three tectonic plates constantly fight for convergence, they're hit by thousands of earthquakes each year. From small tremors to quakes of cataclysmic proportions. In 2022, there were a total of 20,277 earthquakes in that year, similar to previous years. However, in 2023, this has already almost tripled, with Turkey receiving 49,184 earthquakes so far. But on that fateful morning, as the snow and the wind battered homes, at approximately 4.17 a.m., millions were jolted out of their sleep by an absolutely colossal 7.8 earthquake, its epicenter located around 60 miles from the Syrian border, approximately 6 miles below the surface 
in the Gaziantep province. Now, describing the true strength of this type of earthquake is difficult. It was classed as a major earthquake, the maximum on the Mercalli intensity scale. With this size of quake, destruction is total. Waves are seen on ground surfaces, all buildings sway heavily and most are destroyed, lines of sight and level are distorted, objects are even thrown upward into the air, and fatalities are almost guaranteed. This earthquake lasted a staggering 75 seconds. Each second must have been absolute hell, knowing that each one could be your last. This turned out to be the largest earthquake in Turkey since 1939, and it was so strong in fact that it was felt as far as Gaza, almost 400 miles away. The initial earthquake struck overnight on the East Anatolian fault line that runs through southern Turkey and at 7.8 on the magnitude scale is by far the largest in the region in living memory. By the time it had passed, 2,000 homes and buildings were instantly reduced to rubble, killing around 1,500 people in their sleep and injuring thousands more across Turkey and Syria. As buildings collapsed, they trapped hundreds of thousands beneath rubble and debris, and as people recovered and battled to escape the crumbling buildings, just 10 minutes later, the aftershocks began further damaging buildings and hampering rescue efforts. Emergency teams attended emergency calls to find pure horror. Whole families were trapped under rubble, compressed in small spaces between twisted metal beams and giant piles of concrete. Survivors could be heard screaming and shouting beneath the rubble, but getting to some of them would prove an impossible task. To make things worse, it was the middle of winter and a deadly storm was coming the bitter cold was the biggest concern. Blankets, food and water were provided, but the task on hand was just immense. By noon that day, whole communities came together to assist those injured. But this is when the full scale of the disaster slowly became clear. Thousands were already dead, hospitals were overflowing, and buildings continued to collapse all around. The whole country was in crisis. Heart-wrenching videos on social media showed families in tatters at the side of the road, right beside what looked to be their family home, now reduced to rubble. However, at approximately 1.24, 12 hours after the first quake, a second absolute monster earthquake struck again. <laughs> Gel, gel, gel. Gel, gel, gel. 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 Gel
What makes this event so unusual is that nine hours after the initial quake, a huge 7.5 magnitude aftershock, almost as strong as the first, happened here 100 kilometers to the north in Camaranmaras province. As well as being violent, both the initial quake and that aftershock were relatively shallow in the Earth's crust, 18 and 10 kilometers deep, respectively. The closer to the surface, the more damage a quake will cause. This time, 75 miles north of the last epicenter, it was a 7.5 on the Richter scale, and of course, the highest on the Macaulay scale. This caused thousands of more buildings to collapse like pancakes. People standing on the road trying to help those injured from the last earthquake suddenly found themselves in mortal danger. As the first night settled in, it began to snow heavily. And as darkness settled, thousands remained trapped beneath rubble, some not even knowing if rescue was coming. The next day, as rescue efforts continued, the globe watched as the whole disaster unfolded. Against all odds, rescuers found people alive under the rubble 11 days after the first quake. As the weeks rolled on, countries and NATO stepped in to provide aid. Throughout the following weeks and months, the aftershocks continued, causing buildings that were already heavily damaged to suddenly collapse. Of course, these monster quakes caused massive, widespread damage in an area equal to around 140,000 square miles, equal to about the size of Germany. An estimated 14 million people, or 16% of Turkey's population, were affected. Millions lost their homes, and 214,000 buildings have collapsed or are at risk of doing so. In total, a terrible 50,259 people lost their lives, leaving a staggering 121,000 people injured. There were 50,783 deaths in Turkey and 8,476 deaths in Syria. Mysteriously, 297 people have still not turned up. Some families waited for days by collapsed buildings, hoping to see bodies of loved ones that never resurfaced. One family from Syria got their brother, their sister, their mother, but their father just never appeared, even once all the debris had been cleared up. The affected family said, and I quote, I can't find my father anywhere in the world. Not under the rubble, not in the hospitals, not anywhere. Turkey and Syria continue to reel from the effects of these quakes, but up to this very day, there's still a hell of a lot of work to do to rebuild what was destroyed. This story begins in March 1980. The tranquil beauty of the Pacific Northwest was about to be shattered by an event of cataclysmic proportions. Mount St. Helens, a stratovolcano in Washington state, had been inactive for over a century. But in 1980, it suddenly awoke with a vengeance, leaving a deadly trail of devastation that would forever alter the landscape and the lives of those in its shadow. Mount St. Helens began to show signs of life after a prolonged period of dormancy. Earthquakes beneath the mountain surface hinted at the pressures building within. Magma, molten rock from deep within the earth was pushing its way towards the surface, setting the stage for an epic eruption. A month later, in April of 1980, as the days passed, tension mounted. Swarms of earthquake rocked the region and the mountain's north flank began to bulge ominously. Steam and ash vented from the volcano's summit 
a warning of the inferno that was brewing within. At approximately 8.32 a.m., Mount St. Helens unleashed its wrath in a colossal explosion. The once familiar summit completely collapsed, triggering a massive landslide that gave way to an explosive lateral blast. The force of the eruption was equal to 10 to 50 megatons of TNT. It's hard to even comprehend that amount. It was the equivalent of 25,000 atomic bombs released over the city of Hiroshima during World War II. This blast unleashed a towering plume of ash and debris that raced across the landscape at an incredible speed. In a matter of minutes, everything in the path of the blast was completely obliterated. Forests were flattened, rivers were dammed with debris, and the once blue sky turned into an apocalyptic haze of ash. The lateral blast extended for more than 230 square miles, leaving a charred and desolate landscape in its wake. The once beautiful green forests now resembled a grey wasteland. The force of the eruption had triggered a massive avalanche of ice and snow, further adding to the devastation. Despite the colossal eruption, only 57 people lost their lives. David Johnson, a young scientist, was one of the first casualties of the eruption. He was monitoring the volcano from a ridge that was consumed by the lateral blast. Harry Truman, an elderly man who had refused to evacuate, tragically lost his life with his lodge near the mountain. Highways and infrastructure were damaged and 200 people lost their homes. In the years that followed, life slowly returned to the barren landscape. Nature proved its resilience as the plants began to reclaim the ash-covered ground. Wildlife has since returned and scientists are closely monitoring the recovery process. The eruption of Mount St. Helens left an incredible mark on both the landscape and our understanding of volcanic activity. The scarred terrain stands as a powerful reminder of nature's awesome power. This story begins in August of 2017. A deadly tropical storm was forming and its destiny was to wreak havoc on the lives of those in its path. This storm would soon become Hurricane Irma. In 2017, the tranquil azure waters of the Atlantic Ocean were swiftly transformed into a battleground. Hurricane Irma, a behemoth of a storm, emerged as one of the most powerful hurricanes ever recorded. In early September of 2017, the signs of Irma's strength became evident as it gained power over the warm waters. Weather experts watched with growing concern as it rapidly intensified into a Category 5 hurricane, the highest category you can get. The storm's sheer size and intensity were a warning of the chaos it would unleash. On September the 6th, with Florida and other parts of southeastern United States in its projected path, millions of people braced themselves for the storm's impact. A mandatory evacuation was issued for the majority of Florida, warning people of the impending danger of the storm and to not underestimate it. While some decided to stay and risk their lives, thousands huddled together in community and sports centers to ride the storm out. But they were in for a shock. As the Sunshine State went dark, in the late hours on September the 10th, Irma's fury struck the Florida Keys with a vengeance. Ferocious winds, storm surges, and torrential rains battered the islands, leaving a scene of devastation in their wake. Most of the roads flooded, turning the state of Florida into something right out of an apocalypse movie. The 
Before it even arrived in Florida, Irma had wreaked havoc across the Caribbean, islands like Barbuda, St. Martin, and the British Virgin Islands bore the full front of its fury. People died and homes were reduced to rubble. Entire communities were left without power, water, and shelter. So the Caribbean islands also faced a long and arduous path to recovery. As the hurricane churned northward, its impact was felt across Florida's Gulf Coast. Cities like Naples and Tampa faced the brunt of the storm's wrath. In Naples, water levels rose by two meters in just 90 minutes. As it passed through, homes were destroyed, trees were uprooted, and streets were flooded, knocking out the power to more than 6.8 million people. Emergency teams worked tirelessly to save lives and provide aid to those in need. Neighbors helped neighbors, and strangers offered shelter to those displaced by the storm. Hurricane Irma was the first Category 5 hurricane to strike the Leeward Islands on record, and at the time, it was considered the most powerful hurricane ever in the open Atlantic region. However, this was broken just two years later by Hurricane Dorian, who we'll take a look at in a future video. Irma was also the fifth costliest hurricane to hit mainland United States, causing an estimated 50 billion in damage. Entire neighborhoods lay in ruins and the road to recovery was a daunting one. Communities in the end rallied together and aided by volunteers and relief organizations, they slowly rebuilt what was lost. In total, 134 people lost their lives and may them and the people in this video rest in peace. But what crazy footage. Seriously, absolutely insane some of the footage in this video. As always, I'm interested in all your thoughts below. The flooding in Petropolis just shocked me. It's just crazy. And not to mention Australia's Black Summer. That footage just left me gobsmacked. The intensity and the strength of the flames instills pure fear. But just before I go, if you're into true horror lifestyle content such as this, go ahead and smash that subscribe button. And don't forget to tap that notification bell to be alerted when I release content such as this. But I will see you guys in the next one. Bye bye.